So this is Ecclesiastes 3, 1 through 8. There is a time for everything and a season for every activity under heaven. A time to be born, a time to die, a time to plant, a time to uproot, a time to kill, a time to heal, a time to tear down, and a time to build, a time to weep, and a time to laugh, a time to mourn, and a time to dance, a time to scatter stones, and a time to gather them, a time to embrace, and a time to refrain, a time to search, and a time to give up, a time to keep, and a time to throw away, a time to tear, and a time to mend, a time to be silent, and a time to speak, a time to love, and a time to hate, a time of war, and a time for peace. So, those are the seasons of life, I guess, according to Ecclesiastes. Is there working now? Yeah. Can you hear me now? Ooh, nice. Excellent. Um, by the way, that was 28 seasons. That's a lot of different changes and seasons that we have in our life. Um, the reason I brought this today was Christina and I were in the airport uh, just the other day, and uh, we landed, we went to go grab a bite to eat, and um, this was sitting in front of the cash register, not this one in particular, I didn't steal the two. <laughs> Something similar to this was sitting in front of the cash register, and it says, for your change, leave it here. And um, I think most of us at some level do fear change. We fear what tomorrow brings with its um, unpredictability. Um, I remember uh, my Bible school just closed, so I've been thinking about that, and there was a Taco Bell that me and my friends would always go to in Issaquah, and it was, um, by definition, janky. Now, that's an, uh, maybe an unfamiliar word to you, but janky means kind of sketchy and not altogether beautiful and nice. Uh, so this was a particularly janky Taco Bell, and Taco Bells are not already on a high standard, so... Um, but this particular one, it just didn't seem like any of the employees really cared about what was going on inside of it. And so we would laugh because we'd all pull up in the drive-thru, it'd be like four of us, and we'd order like eight things off of the menu. And what you actually got was totally different. We never once got our order actually made the way that we had requested. And so we'd open up the bag and see what we ended up with. And sometimes it was better, and sometimes it was worse. Um, and that's kind of how life is. You know, we, we put in our orders, we have our hopes, we have our desires, we have these things that we're working for. Um, and sometimes life turns out better. Wow, a, a career change, a, an early promotion, uh, a problem that we thought we'd have to take care of, we get to it and we realize somebody already handled it or it just went away. And uh, there are blessings that surprise us along the way. And other times we open up the bag and we find uh, things that are not what we want. Um, that routine checkup didn't go very well, and now there's a health issue, or uh, a relationship uh, turns dramatic in a not-so-positive way, or a career change, uh, or adjustment needs to be made, and it's not in the order that we would want them. Um, I love that Ecclesiastes passage that we read, um, but unfortunately, we don't get to order the seasons, do we? They come at us. And um, half of those seasons, I think, I probably wouldn't want. I don't really want a time for a war or a time to uh, throw things away. I like the time of accumulating and the blessing <laughs> instead. Um, the best new seasons of our lives, even the ones that we celebrate, um, can be frightening. If you think about it, we throw these parties for, congratulations, you've just graduated. Do you know how scared... Somebody is when they're graduating and all of a sudden they have to face the real world and figure out what to do with their lives. Or um, a new baby. If any parent has just about to have their first baby and isn't frightened, I would worry about them. They should be scared. This is the unknown and kind of a big deal. Uh, marriage. Uh, retirement. I was sitting there with my grandfather and as I look, I go, man, he's so much in a better place now. But that's scary. You're looking out at the edge of something that you've never experienced before. It's a scary thing. The unpredictability of tomorrow, the fact that we haven't been there, uh, can make us anxious and worried and fearful. Um, and I think there's a lot of ways that we handle that. I know for me, I'm sort of the depressive, pessimistic type. You might not think so just because I'm kind of joyful or content or whatever, but there is this sense of me, and this is how I prepare for tomorrow, is I imagine that it's just going to be as bad as it can possibly be, because I figure then I'll be pleasantly surprised, no matter how it turns out. Um, 
I've had some troubles with this, though, along the way, because I find it very hard to hope. And I have a hard time dreaming about what could possibly come. Um, I think my dad was the exact opposite. He was an optimist. So he always imagined things were going to be the best way that they could possibly be. And um, it was sort of weird because he just seemed detached from reality. Like there was a naivete about it of, Dad, you're not even seeing what's going on. So you just imagine it's going to be the best. And I know that for him, life often felt like a series of disappointments. Because it never turned out as good as he had hoped it would. Um, controllers, I think that's another thing we try and do. We manage, we work hard, we get up early, we make sure that life is going to happen just the way we want it to happen. And in the process, we end up trying to control God, we end up trying to control everyone else. And uh, the big secret is, you don't control squat. Uh, <laughs> there's a wonderful pastor by the name of Ed Dobson, who um, I really appreciated some videos he made about his experience with having ALS. Um, and what that kind of brought into his life. And that was one of the realizations, is that no matter how much you think you're in control, you're not. And there is a freedom in recognizing that and embracing that. And as I think about this, this issue of trying to control our future and, and doing everything we can to keep things comfortable and the same, um, it strikes me that that's exactly what the Pharisees were trying to do. And it led them to reject the Lord and to kill him. Um, and then there's another approach that I think we can take, and that's just to resign and say, well, whatever life throws at me, that's what it's going to be. And in the process, we will either blame someone else or we will blame ourselves and we will become the victims of life. And God certainly has more for us than that. So there has to be another course through this. And um, Jesus had some stuff to say about it, and that's what we're going to look at. So Matthew 6, 25 through 34. Um, I'm going to read it for you. I'm going to read the last verse first because it, uh, I think it'll help us understand how this connects. And then I'll go back and read the whole thing. So it says this. Um, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink or about your body or what you will wear. Is not life more important than food and body more important than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in their barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are they not? Are, they, are you not much more valuable than they? Who of you, by worrying, can add a single hour to his life? And why do you worry about your clothes? See how the lilies of the field grow? They don't labor or spin, and yet I tell you, not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the fields, which are here today, and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, or you of your faith? So don't worry saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you. So don't worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. I have to be completely honest. When I read, don't worry about tomorrow. Each day has enough trouble. I kind of want to shake Jesus and go, yeah, right. <laughs> um, this, this ranks in a, a series of passages that I like to call the yeah, right passages. Like, um, <laughs> consider a pure joy when you face all matter of trouble. Yeah, yeah right. <laughs> How do we do that? That's crazy. Um, it's almost like Jesus, sometimes when I read this, is just saying, well, who could have taught it? <laughs> Don't worry. Be happy, man. Like, uh, but there's some stability. There's some stuff in this that actually gets at the core of why we can approach life this way. The problem with this passage isn't what it's telling us to do. It's the fact that I don't think we always grasp the foundation of why we can do it. So I kind of have broken this down to three sort of tips, practical applications of how we can live beyond the fear of tomorrow. And um, the first is this, live today. Uh, I think so often when we approach life, we say, well, if only this would happen, or once I get here, then I can do this, this, and this. Um, but in the process, we're not actually living in today. And verse 27 says, you can't add a single hour 
to your life. Um, Ed Dobson, that pastor who has ALS, who I, I brought up earlier, who said you don't control squat. Um, he said when you worry about the future, you'll find it very hard to find God. But when you live in the present, you'll find that God is right there with you. Here and now is the only time that we can actually be. It's the only time that we can hang out with God. It's the only time that we can actually take steps that can make the world uh, a better place. It's the only time that God can actually use us. Now, we can make choices and things that will impact the future, but we can only live today. So today, be with God. And the beautiful thing is when we do this, God will prepare us for tomorrow. Um, there's a trust in living in today that says God will give us what we need for the next day. Second um, Corinthians 4.17 says this, For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that outweighs them all. The stuff you are going through today is creating glory in the future. Um, an example, uh, Mother's Day. We were all in the womb at some point. We don't remember it. Um, and we were sitting there in the womb, and while we were in the womb, all these things were happening, uh, like we were getting little arms and eyes and ears, and none of these things you need in the womb. None of them. Your fingernails, all those things were going on. And, um, and then there was this crazy day, the only day your mother was so happy to see you cry, <laughs> and you were born. And on that day, all of a sudden, all these things that had gone through, mom's eating pickles and peanut butter and crazy <laughs> flavors of ice cream, all of that made sense, because we needed all those things now. And I think so often as we go through life, the things that we worry about for tomorrow don't need to be worried about as much as we need to walk with God through things now well, so that we can be ready for what tomorrow brings, whatever it is, blessing or challenge. Um, second thing make friends with next make friends with what's coming next um, God can and will use it the beautiful thing of walking with the Lord is that we are walking with a God who is bigger than our circumstances and when we try to manage everything and keep things under control and make the next day happen the way that we want it to happen we are basically saying I can only accept this um I would say embrace tomorrow, but I think embrace is too strong of a word. Because some of the stuff that comes into our life, we don't want to embrace it. Uh, it's hard, and it's not what we asked for at all. It's actually quite the opposite, and it's it's horrible and disruptive and, and not good. Um, so maybe it's shake hands with it. At least be on decent terms with it. Paul in Philippians 4, it's a, it's a wonderful chapter of scripture, um, says this. Do not be anxious about anything. Don't be worried about anything. Uh, instead, in every situation, with prayer and petition, and with thanksgiving, present your request to God. Um, and then later on in that chapter, I think he shares what this achieves. He says, for I have learned to be content, whatever my circumstances are. I've learned to be at peace, whatever my circumstances are. Because I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty of it. I know the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether I'm well-fed or whether I'm hungry or whether I'm in plenty or whether I'm in want. Um, the great secret is that God is bigger than our circumstances. God is so much bigger than them, and he will find a way to use them. He can overcome the story of your circumstances and bring about good anyway. We have a wonderful lead pastor here. Uh, and he writes these crazy awesome books, right? And they're things like how to get past what you will never get over. Um, John had to live through some stuff for that book to happen. And um, God is the same. He will use whatever our stories entail, whether it's what we want tomorrow or whether it's not. Um, God is the amazing recycler. That green bin outside your house, that blue bin, I guess it is at our house, uh, it gets picked up and all this garbage ends up turning into something incredibly useful. And I believe that that's God's intention with the stuff in our life. But it takes trusting Him. So when tomorrow doesn't bring you what you order, trust that God has the big picture. 
He knows what he's doing. Um, he cares for you much more than he does the lilies or the birds. He's got you. Okay, last one. Keep your feet on the rock. Uh, we often strive to hold on to control uh, and to keep what's familiar and what's stable handy uh, because it gives us this sense of peace that we know what's going to happen tomorrow. Um, there's an incredible aerial photographer who does these fantastic pictures and he, uh, he once said that monotony is the awful reward of the overly careful. Monotony is the awful reward of the overly careful. Um, we think that we can be our own rock, and God has a much better uh, plan in mind. There's a guy by the name of Thor Heyerdahl, um, and he studied how different cultures interact with each other, and kind of historically, and he, he was looking at the Incas, and he, he theorized that the Incas had impacted another culture over here, and they had done so by hopping on a raft and sailing across the Pacific Ocean to this other place. And everyone said, there's no way that could have happened because there's no way they could have sailed the open oceans in a raft. So uh, he did that. He built a raft and decided to prove that they could have actually done this. Um, the story is Kontiki. You can get the movie of it, or I'm sure there's probably a book as well. Anyways, this was a 100-day adventure. Covered 4,300 miles on a raft made of balsa wood. That sounds scary. Um, <laughs> But he said that the danger wasn't actually the sea. The danger was actually on the shore. Because as he stayed on the shore, there was, uh, there was coral and there was rocks and there were all these things that could break up the boat. Um, but actually getting out at sea, having the current bring you where it needed to bring you, was actually a lot safer. Um, and I think in our journey, in our spiritual life, one of the dangers that we don't give enough credit to is holding on to the shore. That's where uh, our spiritual life can die. It's where we can end up embracing a monotony and staying in the safe but not abundant life that God has for us. Um, God has a better picture in mind. And so at some point we have to kind of release and say, that is not my rock. The Lord will be my rock. And then embrace the current see where the Spirit leads us. One of my favorite uh, pastors, a, a mentor of mine, Eleanor Reeker, would always say repeatedly, uh, over and over until you couldn't not say it of yourself, that the best place you can possibly be is right at the center of God's will. And it's amazing how often other places look more tempting to be than at the center of God's will. In John, uh, Chapter 14, Jesus is sitting with his disciples, and um, they have just experienced this awesome, awesome parade. Jesus to be made a king. This was what they were working on for the last three years, building up this giant following of people to walk with Jesus. And now he's going to become king, and they're going to be sitting at his right and his left, being his cabinet, and it's going to be Israel's glory all over again. And, uh, and they have this wonderful... Uh, celebration, and then they go have dinner together, and Jesus says, that's not how it's going to go down. Actually, I'm about to be betrayed and killed. You're all going to be scattered. And they go, no, no, Lord, that, that's, that's not tomorrow. That's not the tomorrow that we envision. We have a much better plan for you. And Jesus says, well, um, this is how it's going to work. Um, but I want to read for you a couple pieces from the conversation that Jesus had with his disciples. This is John 14. He says, um, All this I have spoken while still with you, but the Counselor, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will re remind you of everything I have said to you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. I don't give to you as the world gives. So don't let your hearts be troubled. Don't be afraid. Jesus gives us the Holy Spirit instead of peaceful circumstances. Um, we can't get peaceful circumstances all the time. So he gives us the Spirit. But he says, my peace, I'm going to leave with you. This counselor, um, the Greek word is actually paraclete. Um, and it means para, para parallel, 
right alongside you. And, and the cleat part is appointed to you. God is appointing his very presence to walk beside you through everything tomorrow brings so you can be at peace. You don't need to be afraid. God is with you and he's bigger than what you're going into. It's a powerful thing. And he actually says to the disciples in that same conversation, uh, it would be John 16, 6 and 7, um, because I have said this, as he told them that he's going to leave them, because I have said this, you're filled with grief, but I tell you the truth, it's actually for your good that I would go away, because unless I go, this counselor cannot come, but if I go, I will send him to you. The disciples... Horrible fear of tomorrow was that Jesus would leave them. And Jesus says, that's exactly what's going to happen. But it's actually for your good. And you don't realize it yet. Because by doing this, each and every person who puts their trust in me can have my presence with them all the time, every day, through everything they walk. And now we are 2,000 years later, and we have the Spirit of God with us. Their worst nightmare was exactly what God wanted to do. And it was a beautiful, beautiful thing. It's hard to trust God with tomorrow. But he gives us the spirit. And the spirit is exactly what we need. It's the one who equips us and empowers us for everything we're going to go through. It reminds me of camping with my dad. He was the ultimate Boy Scout. Anybody know the Boy Scout motto? Be prepared. Be prepared. That's right. My dad was prepared for camping at all times. Now, I would tell my dad, I don't want to go camping. I like sitting in my room playing video games and hanging out with my friends. And yet, as I look back on my life, we went to these amazing places. And camping with my dad was quite an adventure. It was not pull up to a campsite and throw up a tent right there. It was sort of pull up to the side of the road where there might be a trail or there might not. Journey a ways, hopefully get a nice view, hopefully. Uh, and then at that place, set up your tent. Uh, or when you got too tired to walk anymore, set up your tent. And so we'd set up our tent, and then the next thing you know, it would start pouring down rain. <laughs> this is the worst camping trip ever. <laughs> Meanwhile, my dad would go, it's okay, I'm prepared. And he would dig into his bag, and he would pull out what must have been a 20-foot tarp. At least in my little brain, it was a 20-foot tarp out of his bag, and then he would have me climbing some tree, tying some knot, as he ran over and found some boulder to hold something else. The next thing you know, we had MacGyvered, a lovely little shade for us from the rain, and started a fire, which usually melted the tarp at some point, and had a nice little cookout. Um, the Spirit is with us. He prepares us. He gives us exactly what we need. We don't need to be afraid of tomorrow because God will be there with us. Um, and the power of that is, is unbelievable. Um, I'm going to try to jaunt us through the story of Joseph because it's, it's the most powerful example of how this can actually work out in a person's life. Uh, you can look in Genesis uh, 39. It's like 39 through 45. We're going to maybe look at the first couple chapters, but I'm not going to read them all because that would be a very, very long sermon. It's already a long sermon, so... Uh, well, I just want to look at uh, his story a little bit. Joseph was the favorite son of his father, Jacob. Um, his other brothers were not so much a fan of this. And as Joseph was growing up, he would have dreams from God. And he would say, look, I had this dream, and you guys are all going to come and bow down to me. It's going to be fantastic. <laughs> and they were not thrilled with this at all. So they said, we've got to do something about this. Let's kill him. And then one of the brothers talked him out of it and said, let's not kill him, let's just sell him into slavery, because then we'll at least be rid of him, and he'll never achieve the screens, which uh, could be good to him. So the worst thing you could possibly happen for a young man, he gets sold into slavery, um, and he's bought on the slave market by a guy by the name of Potiphar, and I want to read for you what happened at his, uh, his stopping at Potiphar's house. It says this, verses 2 and 3 of chapter 39. The Lord was with Joseph, and he prospered there. And he lived in the house of his Egyptian master. And when his master saw that the Lord was with him, and that the Lord gave him success in everything he did, Joseph found favor in his eyes, and he became his attendant. And Potiphar put him in charge of his household, and he was entrusted to his care everything that he owned. The Lord was with him. 
I'm blessed in there. So then he had this wonderful life in Potiphar's house. He grew old and had all of the wonderful things that were going on. Now, Potiphar's wife decided to take a liking to him. He turned her down. He gets thrown in prison. So he goes from favorite son to slave to prisoner. Um, so he gets thrown in prison, and then here's what it says in verses 20 through 23 about his time in prison. And while Joseph was there in prison, the Lord was with him. He showed him kindness and granted him favor in the eyes of the prison warden. And so the warden put Joseph in charge of all those held in the prison, and he was responsible for all that was done there. And the warden paid no attention to anything under Joseph's care because the Lord was with Joseph and gave him success in what he was doing there. So he's in prison, but because the Lord is with him, he's blessed there. None of us would want to choose prison, and yet the Lord could bless us there because the Lord is with us. The next chapter, he's able to interpret dreams that people come uh, by by what the Lord tells him. And um, he interprets some dreams well for people, and then they promptly forget about him. He stays in prison for much, 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 much longer. And then Pharaoh has a dream and needs somebody to interpret for him. Um, And somebody goes, wait, I I remember this kid that I forgot that I was going to do something for. Uh, And he's still languishing in prison there. And um, I think he might be able to tell you what uh, what it is you're looking for, Pharaoh. And so uh, Pharaoh calls this guy out of prison, our Joseph, and, and here's uh, what he says. I had a dream, no one can interpret it, but I've heard that you can. And uh, Joseph says back, I cannot do it, but God will give Pharaoh the answer he desires. And through that interpreting of a dream, a plan is devised that actually ends up dealing with seven years of prosperity in such a way that the seven years of hardship that come next, the unpredictable of tomorrow, um, saves people's lives, changes everything. It's a beautiful, beautiful story. But Joseph experienced incredible drama in his family, horrible heartbreak, um, difficulty, prison, and then being at the top as well. And God brought every chapter, but God was there with him the entire time. And it struck me that the names of Joseph's sons, his sons, the first one is Manasseh, and it means God has made me forget my troubles. And the second is Ephraim, which is God has made me fruitful in my suffering. God was with him, and he's with you, and he's with I, and as we go through each step of our lives. The Lord is there. So as I I think about our lovely tip jar here, um, fear change, leave it here. Um, Fear tomorrow, leave it here. I think God would say to us what it is you're afraid of. (coughs) Leave it here. I've got this. I've got you. You can leave it here. You don't need to be afraid for I am with you. Um, And so I'm going to, as we kind of do our last song, I I just want to pass these out of you folks can help me. Um, I want to invite you, if you feel so led, to to write down something that you're anxious, something that you're fearful about that tomorrow might hold. And at some point, maybe after the service or whatnot, um, feel free to come and put it up here in the change jar. Or if you'd rather hold on to it, put it somewhere where you'll see it, where you can, every time you come across it, you can... Give it to God and recognize that he's got you. The Lord is with you. So live today. Shake hands with tomorrow. And then keep your feet on the real rock. The rock that can actually carry us through whatever tomorrow brings. And that's the Lord. Let's pray. God, thank you that you are with us. Thank you that you give, not as the world gives. Not a string of somehow happy circumstances. Not the stability. Um or the security that we always seek, but would actually lead to to a, a monotony, a sleepiness that wouldn't actually bring forth the things you want to bring about in our lives. Lord, help us to choose you. Help us to choose abundant life with you rather than um, a self-contained bubble that we can stay in. God, we, we give you our lives. We put ourselves in your hand. And we trust you and your grace.
current and where it will take us. We love you. Amen.